Um, we'll kind of go in order with our fellows, starting with Dr. Park, um, and then Dr. San Juan, and then Dr. Wei. Yeah, thank you, Morgan. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Howard Park. I'm one of the Spine Fellows. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about my research project from this year. This uh, talk is entitled The Randomized Controlled Trial of the Erector Spine A Block for Perioperative Pain Reduction and Lumbar Spine Fusion. To, sign the, to kind of set the context and impetus for this uh, project, the opioid epidemics, as we all know, is uh, very large in magnitude. And by the numbers in 2018 alone, 2 million people misused a prescription opioid for the first time. 10.3 misused an opioid prescription at large. Uh, 47,000 people died from overdosing on opioid medications and 50, another 15,000 from heroin overdose, which is a possible common pathway for those who are addicted to opioids as heroin is quite inexpensive and more accessible in certain contexts. Uh, what has been established in the literature is that perioperative opioid prescriptions are a risk factor for opioid abuse and opioid abuse disorders. And um, surgeries that lead to these prescriptions can kind of lead down a cascade of addiction. In addition, as it has been demonstrated um, over and over again, especially within the orthopedic literature, pain reduces quality of life. And as quality of life surgeons are largely that, um, uh, reducing pain should be part of our treatment um, treatment goals for our patients. And it turns out surgery is quite painful, especially spine surgery. In this study, a figure taken from a study of 179 surgical procedures, the pain intensity on the first day was measured. And these are the top 10 surgeries. Three of the top 10 uh, include spinal fusion um, and uh, within this, the field of spine surgery. So as a consequence of the pain that's incurred, the quality of life enhancements, as well as reducing the amount of opioid prescriptions, there has been a call for multimodal pain control strategies. Uh, pain control strategies that can start either at the trauma bed of the surgery, uh, peripheral nerves, dorsal root ganglion, the spinal cord, and all the way up to the brain. One such modality that is being studied here in today's presentation is the erector spinae block. It's a combination of local anesthetic and uh, steroid uh, administered um, to, the, to the dorsal root ganglion, or it's proposed to be administered there for local anesthetic effect, as well as anti-inflammatory effect of the steroid itself. So how did we develop uh, this randomized controlled trial? Well, that's uh, kind of a story in and of itself. Um, several years ago, predating my time here, a block was developed with our anesthesia colleagues and a formulation of half percent marcaine and four milligrams of dexamethasone has been used since here at the University of Utah. We, we performed a retrospective study um, uh, for pilot data, and this was actually um, published this year. And this is from the, um, this was the main project of the fellow from last year as well. And then I kind of came in uh, after this retrospective study was completed and we designed a randomized controlled trial uh, and we applied for various grants. And we were very fortunate um, to receive one through the Lumbar Spine Research Society this past March. So the study question in the, in the, um, the subsequent significance of that is, can erector spinae block or ESB given prior to spine surgery reduce pain? And the significance of this is if ESB, which is a non-opioid pain modality can reduce pain, perhaps we can reduce perioperative opioid use and improve quality of life. The three hypotheses we wanted to aim to test is that ESB placed at the level of a lumbar fusion will reduce pain parameters. It will reduce opioid consumption during the immediate perioperative period of surgery. And uh, it will also improve physical function parameters. The study design uh, to test these hypotheses, this is a single blind randomized controlled trial of ESB versus no ESB in the setting of lumbar spine fusion. Adult patients with degenerative spine pathologies undergoing primary surgery, one or two levels will be included. And anyone with revision, trauma, infection, or tumor um, under the age of 18 or long fusion constructs have been excluded. 
Outcome measures to um, will include numeric pain rating scale, uh, more, milligram morphine equivalents, OzWest Read Disability Index, physical therapy ambulation distance, uh, promise scores including uh, pain interference, intensity, and physical functioning, length of stay, muscle relaxant use, and complications. The actual administration of the ESP includes a 30 cc mixture of 0.5% bupivacaine and four milligrams of dexamethasone. This is injected to the midpoint of the transverse process at the level of the fusion immediately prior to draping. The local anesthetic we hypothesize or we think um, it produces the analgesic effect in the immediate postoperative period and the dexamethasone reduces the um, hypersensitization of nerves and inflammatory um, the inflammatory milieu around the dorsal root ganglion, which hopefully uh, places our patients on a different pain trajectory over time. We performed a power analysis uh, based on our retrospective results and for one-to-one -one randomization with an alpha of 0 0.5 and a power of 0 0.8 or 0.05, excuse me, we um, predicted that uh, 39 treatment and 39 control subjects would be necessary and with a 15% dropout rate, um, about 90 total patients will be enrolled. We are collecting data within the hospital and at post-op week one, two, four, at post-op month three and post-op month six, in which we will close um, um, data collection for that patient. Uh, so far, we have enrolled 34 patients and uh, with regard to sex, age, levels, number of levels fused and BMI, we don't see any demographic differences of significance. Diagnoses are also well distributed amongst these two groups. I'm going to next present a series of uh, graphs and um, that chart the uh, outcome over time points that we've collected for these 34 patients. The red curve will indicate the block group and the blue curve indicates the no block group. Here's the numeric uh, rating scale or NRS for pain. And what we see is there isn't much difference or significant difference at any time point. Although we do see a slight divergence in the curve starting at post-op week two through post-op month three. Again, 34 patients out of our 90. So uh, very early to draw any interpretation or conclusion. In terms of morphine equivalents, we see a similar um, distribution over time. Uh, not much difference in terms of in the hospital, but starting at post-op week four, there's a slight divergence of the curve there. In terms of our um, Oswestry Disability Index, um, this was actually one of the very uh, few um, time points at post-op week six where we saw a significant difference so far. Um, again, we're still very early in our enrollment. This could very much go away, but we do see that the block group seems to have a favorable effect with regard to disability compared to no block. With regard to pain intensity, um, we uh, don't see too much divergence in the curve um, here. We see one here with regard to physical function starting at post-op week six, although, um, and um, here in pain interference, um, not too much to glean from this either so far. Um, in terms of results for length of stay and PT ambulation, there was no significant difference. And thus far, we haven't noted any complications with the ESB administration. Um, I'm going to caveat this slide with a very just, this is a very rough interim analysis, and we're not quite ready to interpret any of the data. But what is interesting looking at the aggregate data is that there seems to be a separation of curves over time. And perhaps this will go away with more data collection. But if this were to continue, it'd be an interesting finding as we thought um, our group actually hypothesized uh, a little bit differently at the beginning of the study that we would see a difference kind of in the perioperative, immediate perioperative period, and then a um, confluence of the curves as time went out. But we're actually seeing a little bit of the converse of that. Um, and we'll see at a final analysis how this looks. So in summary, uh, multimodal analgesic strategies employed for pain reduction and quality of life improvements for patients. Um, uh, this study is is one such study to help promote one of those or to see or approve or disprove. Uh, this is an interim analysis of 34 patients uh, well early and uh, of our goal of, well shy of our goal of 90. Um, and we will interpret data and draw conclusions once the study is closed.
Um, as they say, it takes a village to raise a study. And so I want to thank all my collaborators, and mentors, everyone who's helped along the way. I could not, literally could not have done this um, on my own at all. Thank you very much. Move on to the next presentation. All right. Oops. All right, I'm next. I'm Angie San Juan. I'm one of the PEDS fellows this year. I was fortunate enough to learn uh, and participate in the treatment of club feet this year uh, in fellowship. And I'm focusing on the more difficult group of uh, treating uh, club foot and arthrogryposis. Uh, so arthrogryposis is a term used to describe a heterogeneous group of disorders, uh, which are characterized by non-progressive joint contractures. Uh, these contractures can involve both upper and lower extremities, but most commonly club feet are the most frequent foot deformities that are addressed surgically by the pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Uh, the extent of involvement varies with the least extensive group being the distal group involving wrists and fingers and club feet. Um, the more uh, extensively involved group are the amyoplasia kids that have more proximal involvement of large joints. And then there's a specific group of uh, syndromic children who have pterygia where uh, their connective tissue and uh, skin disorders prevent them from uh, being able to have extensibility of their joints. Uh, we know through prior research that histologically, these patients differ from the idiopathic clubfoot group. Uh, they have a smaller muscle mass with fibrosis, and there's additionally a neurogenic component that lends to their severe, uh, rigid presentation with a high recurrence rate. So historically, these patients underwent extensive release with primary delectomies, and uh, prior studies have been authors have noted that a, a final outcome or goal for these patients are to obtain a deformed rigid foot with a plantigrade platform. Uh, so with the initial high rate of currents with these soft tissue releases, uh, the Ponsetti method and the move towards conservative management has been evaluated and addressed. The Ponsetti method has been utilized and proven effective in treating idiopathic club feet with a series of weekly above knee cast and Achilles tenotomy. Uh, there's over 95% uh, success rate in treating idiopathic patients. So the utility of the Ponsetti method of treatment of the stiffer club foot associated with arthrogryposis uh, is sort of the trend towards management of these patients. And Kowalczyk in 2015 noted a good final outcome with a painless plantar grade foot in approximately 77% of their patients compared to initial surgical release. Um, these are the studies that are currently in literature in the past 15 years that describe the institutional experience of this pretty rare stiffer club foot. Uh, they, as you can see here, have a smaller patient size with a small number of feet and relatively short-term follow-up. They do report their experience in the number of casts, reports of occurrence, and final outcome. However, all this information can be piecemealed with the individual prior noted studies, and no single study has comprehensively reported their treatment outcome from initial intervention to final follow-up. And this is the uh, most uh, comprehensive of those studies by Matar in 2016. He describes his treatment factors, but lacks such details uh, that would be of interest in sharing to patients' parents uh, at their uh, initial treatment and going forward with uh, until final follow-up. And these questions remain uh, are the following. How long were patients successfully braced after initial treatment? What was their incidence of recurrence? Uh, what was done uh, at the time of recurrence? And what was their final follow-up outcome as well as their ambulatory status? So we wanted to evaluate our institutional experience of the Ponsetti method and treatment of clubfoot and arthrogryposis. In regards to treatment factors associated with that initial casting, the recurrence and incidence uh, of intervention, uh, surgical treatment, and the outcome at last follow-up. Uh, we did this through a retrospective chart review at, uh, of patients with a diagnosis of arthrogryposis and clubfoot uh, that were treated at Shriners Hospital from 2004 to 2020. Listed there are the ICD-9 and 10 codes used for the query. Uh, this resulted in 162 patients, and many were excluded for uh, the following factors. Um, a lot of these patients received uh, uh, initial treatment at outside institutions, so sharing treatment at different institution sites, a less than one year follow up, and no genetically confirmed diagnosis of arthrogryposis. All patients were treated using the Ponsetti method. They underwent serial casting with above knee plaster cats uh, applied in Ponsetti technique. 
Uh, cast changes occurred weekly for gradual correction, followed by percutaneous Achilles tenotomy performed in clinic. And following that, a cast was placed for three weeks. All providers followed the following uh, Ponsetti bracing protocol, which involves 24-hour bracing for three months, followed by nighttime or 12-hour bracing until four years with daytime AFOs. A dedicated clubfoot educator in our clinics instructed patients on brace wear, uh, triage uh, parents and patients if they have difficulties with uh, the brace wear in regards to uh, skin breakdown, recurrent deformity, or compliance issues. If there are any concerns, the uh, patient's parents were asked to bring the patient back to clinic from any adjustments. A clinical outcome at last follow-up was to find a satisfactory if the patient had a pain-free plantigrade braceable foot and the failure was characterized as persistent recurrent deformity despite repeat interventions. Uh, this is a similar definition used in the prior noted studies. A total of 162 patients met this diagnosis of uh, the arthrogripotic clubfoot at our institution. After applying exclusion criteria, only 34 patients were available for review and all treatment was initiated within the first six months of life. Uh, there were, uh, all patients had bilateral deformities and in categorizing the type of arthrogryposis, 55% uh, had the less extensive distal type, 35% fell in the amyoplasia category, and 8% had a diagnosable syndrome. In the initial treatment of these patients at our institution, we found that average index casting age was 5.7 months with the range listed there. Uh, this is an older age than the treatment of the idiopathic clubfoot population that's been reported in literature. The average number of casts uh, required for correction was a mean of seven with a range of three to 13. Uh, this is comparative to the means outlined there uh, in previous studies. Um, the average amount of casts uh, comparatively to the idiopathic clubfoot population, it's usually five or six with six being the mean in prior studies. And we found that in our patient cohort, more than a half required uh, beyond the six cast mark to achieve correction. All our patients required a soft tissue release procedure at their index treatment with 91% requiring percutaneous tender Achilles lengthening. The three patients who required uh, further or more extensive release are uh, two patients requiring posterior medial release at index treatment and one requiring primary telectomy. Uh, in regards to the treatment success of index casting, patients were successfully braced for a mean of 17 months. However, there was a huge uh, range with one to 84 months of successful bracing. Uh, there was a high recurrence rate of 88% with recurrence, recurrence being defined as a loss of dorsiflexion beyond neutral and requiring uh, intervention to achieve correction. A majority of these patients required repeat surgery, 80% of which uh, required the following, uh, either repeat tendo Achilles lengthening at 50%, additional 20% requiring a further uh, posterior capsular release, 25% requiring PMR and 4% requiring telectomies. Uh, there was a subset of patients who required casting only, but this uh, again is a smaller group of patients. And again, with a small sample size, it's hard to make certain assumptions and correlations, but in looking at the patients who uh, did not recur, all these patients had distal arthrogryposis and all were ambulatory, and they had a mean initial index at cast number that was five, so less than our uh, mean for our study. So there seems to be an association with the less involved types and gaining independent ambulation and being able to be successfully treated without recurrence and maintain their initial correction. Okay, 68% of the patients met the definition for a satisfactory outcome for a pain-free braceable plantar grade foot at their last visit. When breaking down this group of patients in regards to their ambulatory status, a large majority or 75, 74 percent of patients were independent ambulators with the use of daytime AFOs. 13 percent were wheelchair ambulators and 13 percent had not achieved that ambulation milestone yet. When looking at uh, these, this group that had a satisfactory outcome in independent ambulators, a majority of them were the distal arthrogripotic group. Uh, the average age or final follow-up was six years, but again, the range is listed there. So our institutional data echoes the difficulty in treatment of the arthrogripotic foot with a higher number of initial casts uh, with, to address these deformities requiring 100% soft tissue release and a short period of success until recurrence, uh, which occurred at a high rate of 88%. Our study identifies that a large majority of these recalcitrant club feet require further surgery with BPTAL and posterior release being the most common intervention. 
we achieved a satisfactory outcome based on our definition of 68% with a follow-up of 6.5 years. This is similar to currently published literature with a slightly longer follow-up mean. Compliance as a marker for failure was difficult to assess. It was difficult to determine through chart review the parents did not comply with bracewear due to the occurrence of the deformity, making it challenging to place the patient in braces, or if there were social or familiar issues, uh, familial issues leading to a non-compliance with the bracing protocol. And again, there seems to be an association of patients with less extensively involved distal arthrogryposis and in achieving independent ambulation to maintain a satisfactory plan of great foot. Our study is not without limitations, uh, certainly limited by its res retrospective nature with three different surgeons treating club feet at our institution. All follow the same treatment protocol, but there is subtle variability in each treating provider. Our revised manuscript uh, will include a comparative idiopathic clubfoot cohort, as we can <laughs> experience of both groups. Uh, and we are currently going through the data uh, of patients to have this comparative normal. Uh, future directions are to devise a validated outcome measure to apply to these arthropodic patients. Uh, those of these patients tend to be low demand compared to their peers. A designation of satisfactory with a plantar grade foot does not fully describe their success in overall function. And certainly longer term follow-up could help assess and elucidate the recurrence in their function into adulthood. And then finally, uh, further former evaluation with a gait study could help us uh, with more data in regards to their passive range of motion, foot pressure models, uh, and outcome scores to assess their overall, overall global functioning that cannot be assessed in one clinic visit. So in our study, in our current study, we demonstrate a satisfactory outcome in the treatment of these arthropodic stiff feet but parents should be counseled that although good final outcome could be achieved, the recurrence rate is high requiring further intervention. And then again, I'd like to thank the team at Shriners for their help with this project. Dr. Hennessy, Dr. Weichick, Dr. Holmes for allowing me to care for their patients with club feet and imparting their wisdom and Dr. McCarrowich for guidance throughout this project. Thank you. This is Charlie Saltzman. I think that was a very good study and um... Just wanted to say one thing about it. So Ignacio Ponsetti told me that uh, it didn't, his technique did not work for, for arthrogryposis and all needed a secondary surgery. So I think that's consistent or pretty consistent uh, with this group. Um, but that you were able to do this with very limited surgical intervention is really the impressive part. Very few of them, only one or two, I guess, had telectomies and a quarter had uh, PM, PMRs. And I mean, that's, it's quite, quite impressive because I, if you don't know the background, the background is that every kid with atherogryposis um, used to have a very major surgery. And now you've left most of the tissues you've left, and you've done, done surgery that for most of them is not going to interfere um, with soft tissue healing or um, cause any ill effects in terms of further um, um, contracture of the ligament. So I think this is a very important study and I commend you for doing it. Thank you for presenting it. Thanks, Dr. Sheldon. Uh, good morning. My name is Aaron Way. Uh, I'm also a pediatric orthopedic fellow. And uh, today I'm going to be discussing medial epicondyle fractures, uh, specifically uh, different implants that are used uh, for fixation and uh, trying to determine which one is best. Uh, so some background, the medial epicondyle fracture um, is a pretty common uh, fracture pattern that we see in, uh, in the ER. And um, not all are treated with surgery. There's uh, a systematic review that showed over 92% uh, bony union rate with surgical fixation um, and about 50% uh, non-union or fibrous union um, rate, not all are symptomatic with non-operative treatment. Um, and therefore the indications um, are for surgery are debated, certainly a um, indication for surgery would be a uh, incarcerated fragment. Um, displacement, I think a general rule of thumb is greater than five millimeters of a displacement and medial contact fractures is a <laughs> indication of surgery, but uh, some authors report uh, good outcomes with uh, up to 15 millimeters displacement. 
and other um, providers uh, <clears throat> consider a uh, associated elbow dislocation as a relative indication um, to uh, secure down the flexor pronator mass to strengthen the uh, stability of the joint. Uh, however, there's no evidence or no publications reporting uh, the size of the screw or specific implant um, in regards to the rates of hardware removal. And so in performing this study uh, and looking at the charts around 2016, 2017, a couple years ago, found that there was a kind of a paradigm shift where prior to that, the most common fixation that was used was a four five uh, millimeter uh, cannulated screw, and that transitioned more to the 40 cannulated screw. Um, and so the purpose of this study is to uh, provide some data and evidence um, to prove or show that using the 40 cannulated screw um, results in a lower uh, hardware removal rate. And so some recent related studies uh, primarily out of San Diego, uh, this Rickert et al. study specifically looked at um, biomechanical uh, fixation strength, um, a cost analysis, as well as clinical outcomes and rates of hardware removal in um, mediocondyle fractures that were fixed with either K-wires, suture anchor, or compression screw, and they used uh, 4 cannulated screws. Um, they found a 25, a 26% uh, rate of harder removal in the uh, screw cohort, um, but the associated cost uh, was more expensive overall in the uh, group that was fixed with cannulated screws. Uh, other studies looked at um, screw fixation uh, with and without a washer. Uh, these studies have conflicting uh, results tell at all, this was a systematic review showed that there was no difference in rate of hardware removal um, or clinical outcome with or without uh, the use of a washer. Uh, Henricus et al. Um, out of Penn State showed that uh, there was a higher rate of symptomatic hardware requiring hardware removal uh, when a washer was used. Um, back to the study out of San Diego, uh, the conclusion is that while screw fixation did result in the uh, the most biomechanically strong and stiff construct, and it did allow patients to uh, mobilize sooner, the screws are more frequently symptomatic, uh, necessitating a harder um, removal surgery. Um, at their institution, the cost of a hardware removal surgery is $11,000. The cost of ORAF surgery for any of these um, um, any knee up condyle fracture based on CPT code is $25,000. Implant costs, uh, as you see here, uh, candidate screw costs $250. Suture anchor costs $285. K wires, along with $25. So the total costs here are similar, but uh, the screw cohort uh, was slightly more expensive. So the primary uh, question that I set out to answer was Does implant type affect the rate of hardware removal? Other questions that uh, we wanted to answer were, um, are we able to identify any other factors that, that can uh, predict um, <clears throat> uh, the need for a hardware removal surgery? Um, does a washer, in fact, increase prominence and need for a hardware remo removal? And are there any other difference in outcomes or complications um, associated with different uh, fixation constructs and implants? Uh -oh. Okay. So um, we performed a retrospective chart review for the past 15 years from 2014 to 2019 um, of all patients who had a IC9 or 10 code uh, for displaced medial ep epicondyle fracture and a operative CPT code for um, fixation uh, of that uh, medial epicondyle fracture. Um, 208 charts were identified. We did exclude 44 charts either due to inadequate records um, 
incorrect diagnosis. Um, some patients had a medial condyle fracture or a lateral condyle fracture that would, so it was not a medial epicondyle fracture. And then um, of these over 200 charts, um, some of the constructs that were used were not uh, one of the five most common that we looked at, such as um, a suture only in a very young kid. Um, one patient got multiple screws and um, one patient got a three, five um, cortical screw that was not a cannulated screw. And these patients were excluded. Um, outcomes that we looked at primarily, the primary outcome was the rates of um, symptomatic hardware removal, um, overall complication rates, specifically um, stiffness at final uh, follow-up, um, which we defined as greater than 10 degrees of loss of either extension or flexion. Um, we also looked at rates of heart uh, physical therapy referrals given um, along the way as, I guess, a surrogate for uh, stiffness or kind of a delay in uh, return to normal range of motion and also post-operative uh, ulnar nerve symptoms. So 165 patients uh, were included with an average of 20 weeks average follow-up time. So this first chart here, um, looks at um, the factors that affects hard, hardware removal rates. And so we really have five groups. Um, the fifth group that is not included in this chart is uh, patients who were fixed with K-wires that were placed percutaneously um, because those K-wires were all removed in the clinic um, and not uh, taken back to the operating room. So minus that group, um, 139 patients, um, 88 uh, did not require hardware removal, and 51 uh, did require a return to the operating room for hardware removal. There was really no difference in age between uh, the patients who kept their hardware versus had it removed, uh, BMI, presence of a dislocation at the time of injury. Um, we did, with a univariate analysis, show that um, there is a difference, and really the only factor that affects the rate of hardware removal is the type of implant. Um, and then there's a small number of seven patients that uh, were polytrauma patients. This did not affect the rate of hardware removal. Now, uh, the use of a 4 cannulated screw resulted in a 30% rate of uh, hardware, requiring hardware removal. A the larger 4.5 millimeter screw uh, resulted in a 47% uh, rate of hardware removal. And um, these rates are uh, pretty typical when compared to other studies, such as the study out of uh, San Diego from Reedy Children's. Um, all 11 patients who had hard uh, K wires that were buried underneath the skin were taken back for a uh, hardware removal. And then 21 patients, all of them. Uh, who received suture anchors for fixation um, did not require hardware removal. Uh, a multivariate analysis looking just at the 4.0 versus 4.5 millimeter cannulated screws uh, showed that in the 4.0 uh, uh, cannulated screw, it said 30% hardware removal rate versus 47 hardware removal rate. While this was not statistically significant, it trended towards significance. And I think with um, more numbers and more patients um, enrolled, for example, if we extend this out to include all the patients from 2020 and 2021, um, I think we will eventually um, achieve uh, significance. Uh, the other factors, age, gender, BMI, um, and the presence of a dislocation were not predicted um, of hardware removal rate and also um, pretty associated with any specific fixation implant type. Specifically looking at the use of a washer, um, in the patients who received fixation with a 4.0 cannulated screw, 19 did um, also have a washer. Um, and so the hardware removal rate in patients who had a washer plus a 4 cannulated screw was 47%. 4 cannulated screw without a washer was only 22% hardware removal rate. In patients who had a uh, four or five millimeter uh, cannulated screw with a washer, 
it was a 56% removal rate and a 4-5 candidate screw without a washer was a 45% hardware removal rate. And so here's a uh, figure that um, depicts the, that data. And uh, basically the conclusion from here is that a 4 candidate screw with a washer has a very similar hardware removal rate as a 4-5 candidate screw without a washer. But um, a 4 candidate screw without a washer is um, about 22% hardware removal rate, which is very similar to the study um, findings from uh, San Diego. Complications by implant type. So um, overall complication rate, there was uh, no difference between groups, um, ulnar nerve symptoms and stiffness. There's no difference between groups and physical therapy uh, referrals that were given were also uh, similar between all groups. And so, Final conclusions uh, we can draw from uh, this data is that the 4.0 millimeter um, cantilated screws, it trended towards significance. Um, we, this study was underpowered and uh, we need to have 46 patients per group um, to um, be uh, adequately powered. Uh, and I think that if we include patients from 2020 and 21, um, that we will um, achieve the, the numbers, um, but it trended towards significance to um, show that uh, the smaller 4 ohm cantilever group will, can result in a lesser hardware removal rate. The other factors, age, BMI, presence of dislocation, and um, presence of polytrauma were not predictive needing hardware removal. Um, using a washer, um, can increase the chance of being symptomatic and requiring a hardware removal uh, with the 4.0 screw um, using a washer increases the uh, hardware removal rate by 25% to a similar level as um, a similar hardware removal rate as a 4.0 candy screw without a washer. And the overall complication rate, specifically looking at ulnar nerve symptoms and stiffness uh, were similar between uh, fixation constructs. And then finally, I uh, just want to say thank you, Dr. McCarrowich, for his uh, mentorship with this study. Um, from all stages of the study, from design, data collection, also data analysis, um, and Dr. McWilliams uh, for uh, this just statistical and data analysis and uh, creating the uh, figures. I definitely would not have been able to uh, do this, do any of this without uh, the two of them. Thanks everyone. Any questions or comments or anything before we wrap up? Okay, I think we will go ahead and end. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.